Bruce, why don't you add a few comments and then we can get into the This is a historic night in Harlem and there are many here who know how long it's taken to get to this point, such as Gail Brewer, who's been working assiduously as well as the congressman since the 90s, prior to the internet, with an idea that this would be the place where technology could come together, people could come together and make this a place where we would basically move into the future together. We're going to change our normal format where normally we kind of recognize people and do our talks because we have a very exciting um, discussion that we'd like to get into. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it back to Clayton. And thank you so much, all, for being here. All right. So with that, um, we have another presentation following this um, tech talk. Uh, with a group called those of you who own businesses on, along 125th Street, they're offering a free um, internal Wi-Fi for your for your for your uh, space. <laughs> so I hope you guys are enjoying this. It's a beautiful facility in Harlem. So we're gonna, Bruce, you want to take a seat over here and take a high tech. It is <laughs> the seats that you're sitting in. They collapse and go into the wall when we have a dinner here. In this very same place, so. That's right. Complete, completely modular. So if you're planning an event, make sure you consider this. I'm going to have these seats going to the wall. I wanted to just quickly thank uh, Hannah Kim, who is here, who works on Congressman Rangel's team. She was very instrumental in pulling this together as well. Thanks, Hannah. So we're going to allow um, David Ohm to say a few opening remarks. Um, and really get it's on its own footing. And if you look at the country itself, um, there's no real natural resources of Korea. It's not necessarily in the best location geopolitically, uh, given the interesting relationship it has with the North and neighbors all around. It has thousands of years of history of being invaded by foreigners by different countries. And it's a very small country. It's, uh, South Korea is about 40 million people. So really, you think to yourself, what happened and at the end of the day they just made goals for themselves and said you know we've got to get out of this situation we're in we're going to set goals we know where the future's headed it's going to be making big bets and a lot of the big bets run technology and industry and i think now uh korea is uh number 11 world economy number eight trading partners you said so it's 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 fascinating for me to see as an american uh with great admiration and respect for how a small country has been able to evolve like it has. And um, it's been also interesting to work in a company that obviously is headquartered there, but is truly a global company. Uh, so, uh, and maybe I'll just end it with this, but um, we sold the Galaxy S4 in over 200 countries and with over 350 carriers, partners around the world. So it's truly a, a global company. And you know, what I think is interesting about technology, and, and hopefully I think a lot of what you all talk about is, you know, let's take it back and, 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 and study what's going on. Um, approximately 40% of the world's population has some form of internet access. Right? There's 6 billion people on the planet. 4.8 own a mobile phone. Right? There are more mobile phones today in our world than there are toothbrushes. <laughs> True. Right. And when you look at uh, these trends, mobile of course is exploding. There's more traffic today just on mobile devices as there was on the entire internet in the year 2000. Right. And the growth today within mobile is coming within content type within video, but obviously lots of different services. But it truly is global. Right, so, uh, poll, or quiz, out of these three regions, where is there the greatest growth, right? America. Latin America, Asia, Pacific, Middle East, Africa. 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 It's Middle East, Africa, right? Now, all those three regions are growing over 70% a year, right? So this is truly a huge global phenomenon. And, you know, before, to answer the Congressman's uh, question, I, before joining Samsung, I was at AOL, and, and I was president of AOL Media and Studios. Before that, I, I worked at Google, and I was Google's content czar. I focused a lot on, on content. 
and then uh, you know, I, I started in media and digital media many years ago. I worked at Time Warner when Dick Parsons was the CEO, and, and years before that at NBC. So this this global village that we kept on referring to, uh, that would be created when the internet would become more popular, is actually happening. I mean, technically, conceptually, we have the ability now for one person to connect and speak to, like, literally billions of other people. And in fact, if you follow the latest Facebook stats, they have, I think, a billion two, something like that, a billion two users, and something like 550 million users use Facebook um, on a daily basis, which is phenomenal. So uh, I'll stop there to say, uh, and then you can get your questions, but uh, I joined the company, and I'm really um, getting an interesting view of what is happening on a global scale, and it's really happening. And so I think it's hugely exciting for anyone, no matter where you live, no matter where you're from, um, but particularly in the U.S., particularly if you speak English, um, for us to do some very interesting things. And it's still, frankly, it's still very early days. We're just getting off the ground. So, given your background, David, and the fact that you had been at Google, what attracted you to Samsung? You, you've gone I'm certain to a lot of places, but what attracted you to Samsung? Uh, what attracted me to Samsung was um, that I'd, uh, I just thought it would be a really interesting place to have great box seats <laughs> for what was going to happen in the arena, and uh, it turns out to be true. But there's just uh, the space uh, that Samsung is in, the spaces are so dynamic, and as a consumer I could appreciate a lot of that, you know, what's going on in video and internet and mobile and all, how all that's all coming together. Uh, so I just thought it'd be an interesting place to watch and learn and and do some interesting things and you know meet some interesting people. On the way. So talk a little bit about the Open Innovation Center. What was the sort of the birth of that? What what is it looking to achieve? Can we have one here in Harlem? <laughs> uh, so Samsung's history is in manufacturing world class hardware and. I think it's no secret that you have to get hardware and software right. And I always talk about how you have to have a thoughtful integration of the two. So I uh, launched uh, an organization in January called the Open Innovation Center. And as the name suggests, um, we are focused on innovation and software and services. So the things that would run on a phone, the things that would run on a connected TV. And uh, we are exclusively focused on startups. So we have, I have a lot of colleagues. We have, by the way, 270,000 employees around the world. Um, and uh, uh, we, my group is focused exclusively on startups. So uh, it breaks into four very distinct things, which may be of interest to folks in the, in the, in all, in the audience. Uh, we have an investments group. So we invest in startups. We invest from C round all the way to B, typically. We have a partnerships group, so we're always on the lookout, meeting uh, uh, interesting companies that might be great partners for us on our devices. We also have an acquisitions group, so this is a new group that we just formed and we did our first acquisition uh, of a New York based company actually called Boxy in the TV space. And then lastly we have these accelerators, uh, one in, in New York actually on 26th and 6th and one in, in Palo Alto. And there we are incubating our, our own startups. So uh, we have created our own accelerator, but we are working with, sponsoring, collaborating with a number of different incubators and accelerators around the country. Uh, so as I told the congressman, I mean, I, I think we'd be very interested to explore different ways that we could work with the startups and people here on, on all those dimensions, on, on, across all the different groups that I just mentioned. Well, <clears throat> talk about that. Um, typically, what do you look for in a partner? and is there rules around investment? I mean, uh, how much do you typically invest? Uh, so there are different types of partners in each of those groups. So for the investments group, we will invest you know, anywhere from $500,000 to $3 million. But I think you know, we, would, we make smaller seed investments of a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, typically, we look for 
uh, serial entrepreneurs who are building services that would complement our devices really well. Uh, but we're very open and we're investing in all sorts of different spaces. Productivity, communications, enterprise, uh, healthcare related, education related, etc. So, uh, because so much can be done on a, a, a phone or a tablet, right? Or uh, on connected TVs more and more, uh, we're, we're very open. Bruce, Yeah, I have a question for David. Recently at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, they had a um, the latest state of the telecom event on the future of TV. Could you talk a little bit about how Samsung envisions the future of TV? And one of the things they talked about there was the idea of TV everywhere, and not simply that someone would have two or three devices, that you would have up to potentially ten devices in your home and people being online in very different ways doing different things. Um, so, you know, I think there is a distinction made uh, between TV and video, and I think that's blurring together, right? So, um, the thing that you refer to as your TV today is capable of creating lots of different experiences for you. It may be a linear TV channel brought to you by your cable company or your satellite TV company, but um, increasingly these TVs are connected to the internet. So. Our smart TVs, once you take it out of the box, you register it just like you would a, a smartphone. And it will sniff out Wi-Fi and will connect to the internet. And what that means is uh, you can uh, download apps and have experiences. You can enjoy Netflix, for example, on, on your TV. So you're watching video on what used to be just your TV. So it's not necessarily a broadcast signal. Right? And I think increasingly, you know, we, we've been thinking about apps and different services on our TVs on our smart TVs for a while now. We were the first with an app store back in 2008. This is evolving quite a bit. And uh, our smartphones and our tablets and everything are, are, are now becoming increasingly easier to connect with our TVs or our videos or displays, I should say. So uh, you can, you know, if you're watching a video or photos, you can just put it right on your, your display on your wall. And so what I think the TV is evolving into is a smart display capable of displaying TV or you know, movies from a DVD, remember those? Or <laughs> getting streamed from a service, or just from your own phone. You know, here I am with the congressman, it's a short little video. I can put that up and enjoy it on my, my TV in my living room later on this evening. So I think that experience is evolving. There's a lot of companies, startups in the space, really thinking about how might you create complementary experiences on tablets or your smartphone or even on the TV itself, uh, but hugely, hugely exciting, right? And um, I think you, you're seeing the evolution in experience and product, but you're not even seeing close to different business models being developed. And I think uh, the advertising agencies and the media buyers and, and folks in that part of the ecosystem are watching very carefully, right? Because just in the TV industry alone in the US, it's a plus $80 billion business. Right? And that business exists to get in front of where the eyeballs are. And we know that the eyeballs are going lots of different places and consuming content in different ways. So there's a lot of different like seismic, seismic shifts that are about to take place. And whenever that happens, there's, there's always opportunity for, for smart people. Um. One of the main things we talk about here in the United States, one, because we know we have so many young people who are digital natives, and especially here in Harlem, our young people consume a tremendous amount of content on mobile devices. Um, what is your idea of the role that STEM education can play as what we're doing is building on the fact that all these young people are media literate and they're digirati? Uh, it's so crucial, and Congressman and I spoke about that at our lunch. The, um, what's amazing, I, there was some uh, ridiculous statistic I just read, something like 27% of kids under the age of three know how to use a tablet or something like that, right? And I think if, if those of you who have, are, you know, have relatives or children of your own or see small children, they just kind of like, it's, it's almost intuitive for them, right? This use of technology, and so, on some level, you know, uh, children being exposed to this, and 
for me, I think there's a huge opportunity in through STEM and other other types of curricula um, to really learn not just about how to consume the content, and I, by content I don't mean just video content, but just all the services, but how to create it, how to be a part of it. And I think that is a huge opportunity. And again, it's not just about opportunities here, but it's a global phenomenon, right? And so, uh, in fact, I just, as a great example, I just came from a product review in, my, in our accelerator where we had some of our startups uh, giving an update. And one of my, and, and lot, most of them have actually uh, uh, virtual team members who work from different places. But one of the startups had three different people. One was in Phoenix, and one uh, who just started two weeks ago is from the Ukraine. And this guy was looking for a specific type of developer, and he posted it on one of these open job sites. And this person from the Ukraine answered it. And then they gave him a little bit of a test, and he gave some output, and it was really good. And so now, you know, I'm trying to think this through, and I've never had, I mean, like, you know, there's been virtual teams that I've seen, but this is seamless for this, this founder of this one particular company, and he's used to doing this. And so, you know, on one hand, you know, you could look at, and I think that traditional people would, would hear that and get scared, you know, and say, hey, you know, that could have been an American job, right? And I, I, totally, I, I totally get that. But on the other hand, there's an opportunity for Americans to work across the, you know, anywhere, right? And you know maybe the next job opportunity, maybe there's going to be a huge explosion of opportunity, um, you know, working in Kenya, right? Two decades from now, do I actually have to live in Kenya, or could I work on three different products, one in the Ukraine, one in Singapore, and one in Silicon Valley, and live in in, in Akron, Ohio? I mean, all that is possible for certain types of jobs. So, for me, I'm still <laughs> it's evolving so quickly. I'm still amazed. But it all comes down to how are we exposing and training people so that they're capable of doing this, right? A lot of it's going to happen naturally just because kids, you know, they're texting each other all the time and they're sharing YouTube videos and whatnot. And I mean, that, that would take an hour for me to try to teach my parents how to do that, frankly. And they would get it. But, you know, a six-year-old could do that almost intuitively. But beyond that, what kind of education are we giving them so that they can add on these skills? And I, I don't know if we want to get into that. I mean, Punkson knows more, much more about that than I, but I think as a company, we'd be happy, happy recipients of that kind of talent because right now, there's no shortage of demand for this kind of talent. It's, it's actually a huge shortage of supply, right? Um, and there are literally jobs that are going unfilled for months and months and months. And in fact, people are packing in Academia, they're not releasing certain features, they're not taking their product in certain directions simply because they cannot find this kind of talent. Congressman? It just, uh, it just uh, seems to me that our country is out of focus in terms of the future of America, national security, economic competition. The whole idea that we can lock up two million people with minds and bodies that can be productive. And at the same time, you talk about a, a child being able to want to learn. And we have schools that almost create an atmosphere that they don't want to learn. And when you see uh, countries like China with over a billion people, and they recognize that these people can be trained, as far as America is concerned, I don't see how the hell we can survive on the course that we are on today. It just doesn't add up. Having said that, well, we have minds like are in this room tonight, recognizing that this thinking seems to be far beyond the political arena. Where what you said, David, is that where America should be looking for these minds 
just for economic reasons to be a, a competitive nation, to be so proud of, of, uh, of what we can produce as a country. And yet, the, the school system, for all practical purposes, is not make, uh, making that need. Now, we do pretty good in higher education, since so many people would come here for that. But it's got to start somewhere. I know that the charter schools are controversial. I know that. But their success has been based on a different idea and different sources of resources. And at the end of the day, they turn out a product. And some would say at the expense of the traditional public school. Now, we have this talent in this room. And as you pointed out, the generation ahead of it may not have the slightest idea why these people are meeting here today. And the country certainly hasn't provided any incentive uh, the same way that the, the rollout for the Affordable Care Act broke down on very technical, for very technical reasons. Uh, somehow there hasn't been a communication that what they're talking about here tonight at Silicon Hollow. If this could burst out in different places all over the country, we'll be way ahead. Now, they have the idea here. And we know that it takes more than just will and wanting to do. And what I'm doing is taking advantage of the reputation of a wonderful community that everyone knows that we hear. are just so well known and like Korea we have come up out of the damn ashes mm -hmm. yes. in terms of what we know from our parents and our grandparents as Langston Hughes said life ain't been no Christmas day for nobody in this room <laughs> having said that we still have the romance of the Renaissance era that I was just mentioning where great minds just came to Harlem some of them didn't know where to go. They had no place to stay. They just stayed in the lobby. They just talked with each other. And out of these conversations, they actually became more important and more thinking people. Now we have that here, David. And we have people that want just a little direction. What can we do? I think that Gail, is she still here? I think that. I hate to believe that this could be, in this day and age, a pilot project. But with all the money that we're investing in locking up people, mm -hmm. it seemed to me that opening up people's minds could be something that no one could walk away from. And that is because each one of the people that are here bring a sense of credibility that goes beyond just hoping that we can do better. Each person here knows that they don't need a charter school to educate your kids as to what they're going to have to do to compete. Our biggest job in Harlem and the Harlems around this country is educating parents to know what they should be telling their kids. And sometimes, well, it hasn't worked and you know where that ends up. But if we start off with people that already know that can talk with educators and saying what you know you can produce. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and David said it, there has to be a job there. We can have people to come and tell you what they would like to have. And we can have people to make certain that that is what is being produced. So that, yes, you can study the arts and the culture and, and all of those things, but when you get out there, you've got something to sell to someone that is saying they're thirsty for more talent because this picture is going at, uh, at a rapid speed. I don't know where we go for, from here, and it's a little too ambitious, Gail and uh, Inez, to talk about having our own high-tech school because we have the universities here. 
We have the state university system. We have the city university system. We have Columbia here. We have NYU here. And believe me, David, they're getting billions of dollars and we're not even included in it. I mean, they are now planning right here in my congressional district for billions of dollars to be invested in STEM, which exclude us. Preach. So if we can actually find out, since we don't have the money to invest, but we do have the knowledge and we're step up on so many other uh, communities, especially, I don't want to say rural communities because the Tea Party thinks I'm wrong. They got the Confederate and we should have the future in terms of where the country is not, where the country should be going, not where they hope it would stay. And, and we got the credentials, I think, in this room to do it. But we need a master planner to say, this is what we think if you could produce this, no matter how high the standard would be, if you could produce this, we have experience that this would be the end product. This is what would be ready for the next level. And I don't know where to take it from here, but I certainly would like to listen to the minds that are in this room. Because this is an opportunity to dream with a person that that's all he's been doing all of his life, except his dreams have become reality. But there are things that he would be talking about last year that just didn't exist, or the year before that, or the year before that. And so I would like to see what would come out of this would be a place where kids and adults and educators would say, a seed was planted in Harlem in order to make certain that high tech became a part of our lives, that it would improve our ability to provide the service, but at the same time that the country would recognize that they need us and they will need our children and our grandchildren even more. We can do it. In the Army, they took a dumb guy like me who dropped out of high school, and they said they needed somebody to kill people you know, <laughs> and to operate 18 155 millimeter howitzers with 75 pound projectiles to go seven miles to kill people. I didn't even know who they were or why they were there. And I learned how to do it. And so, we can learn how to do anything because every one of you got a jump start. Right? You got a jump start. <coughs> Your everyday conversation with people on the block, some of them are what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but there's so much more that we have to learn. And I don't know how you ever, you, when you put this much confidence in being together, you have to share with us up here what is that dream, and how can we help to make it a reality? Because the product that you're trying to produce is one that is so sorely needed. And I don't think uh, Gail and, and Inez and I have a hard time when we see the ridiculous things that we're wasting money on and the amount of money that we're pouring into the so-called criminal justice system, and the fact that the whole world knows that this is what the world is going to look like faster than most of us can expect, that if we can produce a product that just makes sense based on the talents that you already have and reduce that to a program, uh, I'm 83, but I can spend the rest of my life pushing that program. And I tell you one thing, that our institutions of higher learning, they feel so damn guilty to be in a community where people from all over the world are trying to get advanced degrees, and they haven't made our public schools work here where they are. You know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. And so I need a little direction because this 
we couldn't purchase, we couldn't buy the professional advice that David and Cassidy are bringing here. But they enjoy this for themselves, for their company, and for their country. I cannot think of anything that's more patriotic or more involved in national security than to get our minds caught up with our country's ambitions and stop talking about killing it, but talking about building and talking about providing. So it seems to me that right in this room, we don't need any body preaching and converting all of you. You, you, the reason you're here tonight is to take it to another level. And I, and I might even add that I think Bill de Blasio, our new mayor, <laughs> and he will be, is the type of person that we can get in on the ground floor. We can get in there because, one, we got the political investment, but you put together something that you got me hooked on. Young people, young ideas, planning for the future, respecting the past. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I think about you and how I can help wherever I go. And so what I, when I said that remember tonight, it didn't mean we got to hit the jackpot at all tonight, but maybe we can start drawing up that plan, our vision, and piece by piece, put it all together. We got a great opportunity. And, and to say something kind about the Republican Party, <coughs> I really think they're on their deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> I really think they're on a suicide mission. But the rich and the powerful see that they're about to destroy the economy of our country because they don't think about what they do because they're motivated by hate and emotion. That's right. Yeah. Now, Wall Street learned this. They don't like entitlement. They don't like poor people and whatnot. But they don't like to see the country's fiscal integrity go down the tube. And so if you have an insane person on your team, that person has to be contained. And it was done to prevent a disaster from happening internationally. Somewhere along the line, whether it's immigration, whether it's investment in infrastructure, or whether it's science and technology, somebody, somewhere, that's got more invested in this country than you and I have, are going to talk to these crazy people and tell them that if you want a party at all of survival, the Civil War is over. <laughs> and that brown and yellow and black folks are in this country. It's no longer a European country. And that we're going to have to think about how we can improve. Somewhere, they got to wake up and find this message. They have to. Because they're batting their heads against a, 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 a brick wall. I don't want to... It, it is so, un I can't even explain, the, 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 the Affordable Care Act, I have never seen a bill that's been so locked in. I don't remember the last piece of legislation that the Supreme Court reviewed. <laughs> you know, I mean, they do better going after eliminating Social Security, you know, or wiping out the churches and the synagogues. It's insane. <laughs> and they're prepared to have our country go down the drain. So I know that's a sick way to, to think positive. But I know one thing, there's no color on science and technology. There's no color on the website. It doesn't come from a whole bunch of liberals in the North. And it's something that they're gonna have to learn to live with no matter where they come from. And if we got a product and they're dying, they don't give a damn what kind of blood you have. All they want to do is to be a part of the growth of this country, as sick as they may be. I think we are on the verge of coming up with something that's brand new. We've been struggling for better schools ever since I've been a kid. But this is a different level that we're talking about. We're going into a different era. Uh, this
this is just like selling uh, automobiles to someone that all they've done is follow horses around all their lives, and they don't know what the hell you're talking about. How you package this, I don't know. But I know one thing, we're not going to waste our time. We've got to come up with something. And, and I yield back to all of you as to where do you think our first start should be. We need a plan. We need a program. And uh, as long as I'm working on the Ways and Means Committee on Taxes, I'm certain that all our international friends will listen to me if I have something <laughs> positive to say about investing in the country. Can I just add one? one yeah, we're going to let you guys ask the questions, but I want David to respond. To I just want to add one thing, um, uh, two, two observations. One is uh, New York City. Uh, one of the questions I often get is, well, Silicon Valley, we get, but why did you create an accelerator in New York City? And after finance, technology is actually the largest source of jobs in New York City. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, Af New York now is the second largest source of venture capital in the country. Uh, in fact, it's the only location, the only geography that had n a net growth from 2007 through 2011. I was just looking at my notes earlier. So it's on an upward swing. So you have these forces. You have the amazing world-class uh, institutions of higher education, you have the capitals of finance and increasing technology and, and fashion and advertising and media all here. And so it, it could be, it should be a fantastic place to drive innovation uh, for the future. That's, that's one thing. And so as people who are, as New Yorkers, uh, that's something that we should all keep in mind and, and uh, understand um, uh, and internalize so we can create more momentum. That's one thing. The, the second thing I just quickly want to uh, comment on, and, and Congressman's remarks really made me think about this, is one of the things that I find most um, amazing about, now this is private sector, like companies that do really well, and I see this with Samsung, which has been really impressive to me, but I saw it at Google as well, is that they have huge, big goals, right? And somewhere along the way, um, people started putting constraints on what their company or they themselves were capable of doing. And I think this is true for Korea as well. I see Korea now really thinking, how can we be more of a center of innovation and, and not just industry? And so this idea of setting big goals, first and foremost, is so important because, you know, after that, you got to get the, the plan and put that in place. But this idea of thinking big is it's actually very difficult to do because we're always checking ourselves. Oh, that won't work, and we're always like, you know, so we don't put stuff out there. But some part of me is beginning to appreciate this idea of thinking really big. And when you meet some of these iconic entrepreneurs, you know, the people who have created what we call these unicorn companies, these startups that become billion-dollar companies, to a person, the one thing that I would say they share in common is that they all think big. They all think big. So there, for me, as an observer and, and as frankly as a as a citizen of the of the city, you know I think that um, we have to think big, and we can't constrain ourselves about what is or isn't possible. And after thinking big, we can let certain realities check us and the plans that that we create. But uh, you got to start by thinking big. And I will tell you, as spending just a little bit of time uh, with people who have built big, new, innovative things, they think big. Well, you're, <clears throat> with Silicon Harlem anyway, we definitely are in that zone where we're trying to think big. We believe that if we do what we're setting out to do, transform New Harlem, it will, in fact, eliminate poverty. It will, in fact, decrease crim uh, crime. You see that in Silicon Valley and other areas where technology is leading the way in the business sector. All of those factors come down. We, we, we are thinking on that level as well. By the way, that watch you're wearing. I watch you. Yeah, I'm taking photos of everyone. You're not the only ones who can take photos of me. I can take photos of you. <laughs> right, I got to get one of those. Um, we have a question back there, Bruce. Say your name, please. 
I'm Bice. My name is Bice Wilson. Uh, I'm a principal of Studio Bice. We're a planning, architecture, and placemaking firm. And uh, I've had the honor of knowing Bruce and Clayton for quite a long time. And I don't know how many of you know the vision behind Silicon Harlem and how old it is. Because these gentlemen have been holding the vision of drawing the infrastructure that Harlem needs to Harlem for decades. And they have kept the faith, and they have done the work, and they have stayed at it. These two gentlemen were co-conveners with me of a process called Designing the Intelligent Public Way. If you Google it, you can see the collaboration site where that conversation happened about how do we design the broadband infrastructure so that it goes where it needs to go to benefit the people in our communities, because it's not being designed. We spent years in colloquia with all sorts of people from Google and academia and all sorts of stuff. And I can give you in seven words the upshot of our study about the power of broadband in economic and community development. Seven words. Where it's not, you can't. Where it's not, you can't. And I would like to ask your permission, Bruce McClain, to turn those words around about Silicon Harlem and say, when it's here, we can. Now, David. I want to offer you a story I heard from a futurist at the American Institute of Architects Conference in 1996 about the redevelopment of North Korea. When the American consultant showed up there to tell them how to redevelop themselves, hmm. <clears throat> he basically said, you know, you don't have anything, and you can't really be anything, and you're going to have a tough life. And they what's, asked a new, him, what's a new industry? What will be a good industry? Well, he said, uh, well, technology, but you can't do that. You don't have anyone who knows anything about it. Said, well, that's not true. Hmm. Uh, we'll send a couple of thousand people off to school. And he did something. He, basically, what the future said is that the Korean approach to the future was, tell me where I need to go, and I'll figure out the resources I need to have to get there, rather than look at the resources I have and tell myself I can't get there. So Silicon Harlem can pull those resources together to make the vision the congressman and you and Bruce and Clayton have been talking about, and when it's here, we can. Very good. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you very much, Bryce. Could we concentrate on the next step? Please say your name. Good evening. My name is Lucius Conway. I'm with Recovery Coaching Services of New York. We provide uh, assistance, guidance, and mentoring to people who have addictive disorders to regain control of their lives. And in terms of the next step, one of the things in the pan recovery movement in America and in the world built on self-directed, wellness-driven recovery from a myriad of addiction and addictive issues. When I thought of Silicon Harlem, and I think of the uh, technology and, and high-tech, a lot of times the science of it devastates, I think, not only me, but a lot of people, and they don't get it. It's not just hardware. It's software, and it begins with ideas. I knew a teacher in Detroit who talked about public education being the killer of the dream. Children vision and imagine outside the box. They think big naturally. We kill that over time. I believe, I believe the beginning of this is creating a space where we reignite it. Because when I come here, I think of Mark Zuckerberg. I think of big ideas. And I believe that even the hardware follows the idea. So what we need is a place where people come together and that is nurtured in them to create ideas. I can guarantee you kids have ideas about apps and everything else. And if we created a space where we could encourage that kind of thing and put them together with the people who could put the hardware together, you'd have exactly what you're looking for. Thank you very much. So one, one of the things that I didn't mention when, uh, when I was asked the question about STEM is that Samsung in, in the U.S. is also very focused in, in terms of our philanthropic efforts on uh, children and education. So I think there, I mean, just you know, a little shout out for my own company. I think that there's an opportunity to explore how we might actually um, take the focus we already have on educating uh, children um, and uh, figure out ways to collaborate. I mean, that's not limited to that, but that could be one really interesting. I thought you'd have a second. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if what we can do is be the mentors, if we can convince the politicians and the educators 
that we got a sponsor and we can convince ourselves at the end of the day that we have turned out productive kids that on their own they can do it. It would seem to me a foot in the door would be these kids that have no hope for the future and I don't want to get involved in charter and, and traditional and I don't want Gail to get involved, but we're talking about a pilot project. We're talking about a pilot project, and it seems to me the best way we can hone our skills and let the whole world know it is to use the kids as the, as the ears to the intellect that you already accumulated. And out of that, it seems to me, that job opportunities, based on the largeness of the ability to imagine this being a city, a community rather, of the future, that there's opportunities for everybody. But I really think that nobody can possibly argue our fight for kids to be able to understand what we're talking about as fast as we can. I don't see any challenge there especially if we can just tell people what international organizations are willing to do. I think we can go down Wall Street and tell them that, that we got the, 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 the product. All we have to do is to develop it. Hi, my name is Martina Abrahams. So I'm here for myself, but I'm also one of the leads for the Black Blue Network here in New York. And you touched on this a little uh, just for now, but I know that filling the talent pipeline, there's a lack of diversity and a lack of supply, like you mentioned. And I know it's an industry-wide problem, so I just wanted to know some of the things that Samsung is doing um, to build the talent pipeline. Um, I would say that the, the constraint on skilled, techn technologically savvy, uh, workers is so um, acute that uh, I would I would say there's not even much fine tuning. You know what I mean? It's not that there aren't enough African American women, you know, technologists or developers, and there aren't. But there's just not, period, enough. And uh, so I, you know, I think it's not for. It's, it's impossible for one company, really, to figure out the solution to that. And in fact, it's hard for even an industry um, to do it. Uh, it's so many different things. It's, it's education, it's mentoring, it's different programs. It's increasing awareness. It's encouraging, and, and, and because you're with the Women's Network, it's encouraging women from very early on, girls when they're in schools, right, not to shy away from math and sciences, right? Uh, not to shy away from leadership uh, opportunities. Um, you know, it's uh, women who are professionals, and uh, Sheryl Sandberg is a very good friend, uh, to lean in. And, you know, there are different types of leaning in, right? Um, but with respect to the kind of things that, that we do, we do all the things that you would think. You know, we, we have recruiters, we, uh, we try to reach out to different programs, uh, go to different conferences. Um, you know, I have a particular sensitivity, uh, given my own background, about how important it is to have a diverse workforce. And uh, uh, not just uh, culturally and, and race and ethnicity, but also gender, especially in technology. In fact, uh, I, uh, in our product review today, I kind of noticed again. I, so we have a general manager in New York and general manager in, in Silicon Valley who just started, and they're both women. Um, it's probably more the exception than, than what you'd expect. Um, but so I, you know, to answer your question, I mean, the, we do sort of the typical comp big company things. Um, but I also think, and, and this might be me, just David on, um, but because Samsung is global, right, we employ, more, more than half of our workforce is actually not based in Korea, even though most, a lot of our operations are there. Um, I think somehow on, on, on one level, because we're a global company, um, I think we're kind of more, I don't know what the right word is, we're, just diversity is just part of what we do. You know, you, you uh, when you're selling TVs in the Ivory Coast, right, your executives running the business are going to be from the Ivory Coast, 
and you're going to be interacting with people from the Ivory Coast. That's just how it works, right? So there is something um, inherently diverse if you're a global company, like a truly global company. And I think we're, we're trying to become more and more of that. Uh, I remember when I first joined the company, the, um, the then CEO, who is now um, helping to manage all of Samsung, um, his name is G.S. Choi, and uh, he's an amazing, amazing uh, executive. Um, one of the things he said to me is, you know, we have to be truly global so that the person running Samsung Africa has to be African, right? And we're not there everywhere, but, you know, we need to move to that. And I think that makes great business sense, too. So, you know, if you're, if you're in the U.S., you know, you're so I, there's, there's more that we have to do. I, you know, I have a personal view on this. I think you just have to have people who are in decision-making positions who have this sensitivity. If not, it's just, it's not organic. And uh, I think it has to be more organic. So, um, I don't know if I, I answered your questions, but we do kind of the recruiting and the outreach and the sponsorships, and we have scholarships, and we have programs, and we support schools and all that uh, in the name of diversity. Um, but I think like many companies, we, we still have, have more work that we want to do. We're going to take a few more questions. I think Bruce has someone lined up now. Hello, good evening. My name is Alice Bill. I'm the co-founder of Young Harlem, which stands for Youth and New Guidance. And we are currently in conversation with educators in, at Harvard and the superintendent here in the city, creating a program called From Harlem to Harvard, working with high school students that want to study within a STEM field, sending them to Harvard um, for a full, for a full uh, four-year scholarship. And we have the educators behind us, but since you mentioned getting the students involved in this mission, um, how can we start to get our politicians behind us in this movement? <laughs> I'll, I'll sponsor some internships, by the way, so you should talk to me and cast me out. Yes! There we go! Do you um, want to respond, Congressman? Or? <laughs> you know, it's amazing how people just say politician, but they have no clue of who they want to talk to. I mean, you got to really ask a politician for help and know their names. Uh, I hate to put this in the form, you know, with all of the problems people have with government, and I go around the country, and sometimes when a mean spirit, I ask, do you know the name of your congressman? Reach. And, and put up your hand if you know them. That's only what I mean. Because most of the people, they just say, well, that's the government. And I, 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 I'm not saying that government deserves any better treatment, but I would suggest for people like this, and this is family, you know, tell me the name of your city council person, your state assemblyman, your state senator, and your congressperson. And I would say that would be a hell of a good place to start to get politicians to, to know of what you're doing. Because we only have a, a two-year contract in the Congress. And I don't think there's anybody in this audience, and I've been saying this for 50 years, has ever called me or written me that they didn't get a response from me. And so if you have to tell people how to get how to get the politicians working, first of all, I'd like to see the lady that was talking because the lights, you know. But uh, it's try. And then if you don't succeed, get in touch with me and I'll make it a lot easier for you to get in touch with. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Brook. I'm a, a partner in a fund, and I, I run a startup called Joyous. I, I, the, uh, the young woman behind me is actually the perfect lead into what I want to say. It's great to send students from here to Harvard. I, I want to make sure that people are coming back to here uh, as, as their place where they work. I get up in the morning, and I take the train downtown. Every day, I go to Union Square Ventures, I go to WeWork Labs, and they're all downtown. <laughs> My friend here goes to Brooklyn to go to work. 
And I think that a first step is physical facility here, incubator, accelerator here, to keep people in the neighborhood, to work in the neighborhood, to have the startups here, in the physical facility here. I don't think that's existent right now. I would like to be part of that. <coughs> yes, I, I'm a big fan of Harlem Garage, but I'm talking about places where I, I'd like to see a real facility like WeWork Labs or General Assembly of that caliber here in the neighborhood where I can put my company so we don't have to go downtown to do our work. That's what I'd like to see as a first step. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. process to go about uh, getting you your philanthropic efforts to fund educational programs. Okay. Uh, for the first question, the investments and the accelerator are actually two different arms. Um, the investments will invest in third-party companies like any other venture capitalist. So uh, typically the process is very similar to getting venture capital where uh, you would have an investor presentation, an overview, and send it over and we'd have calls, meetings, etc. to get to know you and, and the company and make an investment decision. That's not unlike many other top venture capital firms are. Is that for the contract you? Uh, that would be someone who, there is someone who works on my team who does run that group. And uh, we have also uh, an East Coast group, so there'd be some specific people there. Uh, so I can make that, that intro. The, I see you over there. <laughs> I see you. And then uh, the, on, on the accelerator, the accelerator is a slightly different model from other incubators where uh, these are Samsung startups, uh, but we recruit people from the outside. And for us, we are typically looking for serial entrepreneurs, people who have done it before. And um, you know what we always say is, there's a difference between creating a great product and creating a great company. And what we're trying to do is uh, um, create a different path to developing products where we bring in talent and take away everything else that sort of distracts them. Raising money, payroll, benefits, offices, etc., and have them focus exclusively on the product and then give them access to our product roadmaps, our decision makers, and our distribution. So we're just trying to cover the entire spectrum of startups. So we'll invest in third-party startups as VCs, and we'll try to incubate some of our own. So hopefully that answers you first. Uh, in terms of second, the, our, we have a Samsung Electronics America headquarters in North America. It's based in Ridgefield, New Jersey. Uh, they are the ones who uh, manage our philanthropic efforts. And uh, I'm happy to connect you or whomever you'd like to the right people there. But they're, they're the ones who administer our giving back. I want to recognize that guy before he loses his own. <laughs> <laughs> before I do, uh, Clayton, uh, what I hope you will do at the conclusion of this meeting is to pull together a task force that will come up with these dreams, with these plans, so that the politicians can see where the resources are and try to work toward the goals. It, it may not that we go straight to the moon, but knowing that I have promised you that I will be bringing people like David, that you can not be embarrassed to ask any question that you want, uh, then it could be other type of people that you need from the FCC, from the, uh, the Obama administration in terms of investment. And so you need a task force because I know every one of you, I've been in the crowd myself, and every one of you, your mind is going like this and you've got to miss an opportunity, but go ahead. Congressman, thank you. Uh, that's why I'm so proud to have you as my congressman. Quick question, 40% of young black men are dropping out of high school year after year in our urban centers. I am also a partner in a fund here in Harlem called the Harlem Small Business Fund. And we're looking to invest in technology, but we're looking to invest in the kind of technology that someone in a housing project or someone recently out of jail, someone with lax education, but because of what they've learned, they can make um, some, a good living. And as the gentleman said over there, the jobs will be here. So we're not looking to, to if an entrepreneur comes to me and says, I want to be the next Google, we're not interested in them, particularly if they have a Harvard degree. We want this person who graduated from you know, 126th Street, the public school right there, who has an idea and that we could put money in. Please, my question to you is, what kind of jobs or where's the technology going where people on that level could um, or, um, generate income in their community? Good question. Good question. So 
so the first thing I'd say is that's not something that I'm particularly expert on, right? So uh, you you find a much more informed answer from a lot of other people. Um, but my observation has been that um, the successful startups go into big companies, and big companies um, hire lots of people and do lots of different things. And so, um, you know, for those who aren't who don't have the, the startup pedigrees that you expect, you know, first 20 employees into Facebook sort of thing. Um, you know, later on when companies hit growth, the growth stages are turn go public or what have you, they're they're hiring lots and lots of different people. I mean, all you have to do is go to the, the new Twitter headquarters and you see the amazing facility that that is and the and the thousands of people uh, they employ who don't necessarily you know, code the next version of Twitter, and you get a sense of how important companies like that could be to an economy. So, I, you know, my observation again would be there are opportunities uh, to work for technology companies just because they're growth companies and they're looking for people. Um, but with respect to specifically, you know, matching jobs, set the skills, and trying to find paths, that's not something I know as much about. I have to say, I mean, I've been focusing more on the, the traditional startup type. Type backgrounds. I'm I'm glad that you're there. I'm glad that there's a program like that, though. Um, and if there's a way for us to support you in some way, I'd be happy to explore that. But it's not something that I'm that well versed in. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Congressman. I'm going to try to get the last couple of questions in. Yeah, Congressman, my name is Gary Johnson. I'm the State Chair for Economic Development for the NAACP. But not wearing that hat tonight. Wearing a hat as an entrepreneur. I'm also a startup CEO of ParadiseExpress.com. And one of the issues that we've had here as a company that's trying to be global, we've got engineers in Seattle that we deal with, we've got coders in Malaysia, we've got uh, graphics people in Australia that we deal with. We don't have the bandwidth here in Harlem to be able to do some of the things we need to do to be competitive on a global scale or a local scale. And, and that's really holding us back in terms of competition. And I think it follows on what that gentleman said about having it's an accelerator or accelerators yeah. here. We can't do it with the bandwidth that's in Harlem. And we've been, frankly, neglected for far too long. And I know that that's something that you're interested in, that you've been talking about recently, and Councilwoman Dickens has been focusing on, and I, and I hope that uh, Bar President Brewer is working on. But we need that here. We don't need it downtown. We're here. We're trying to create global companies here. And these are some of the smartest people you'll ever meet. But we need the resources here. So how can we make that happen? Well, you got to start somewhere, and like I said, I hope tonight would be a, a night that we uh, uh, that we'll always remember. First of all, uh, I would I would ask that you put together the ideas, the goals that you would want to achieve, and uh, I will be able, just because I'm senior, uh, to go to the different levels of government to find out where some of the answers are uh, to the goals that you would want to achieve. But uh, we've got to get some, some kind of way you're going to have to find how you're going to put this on paper. I don't care how ambitious it is or whether we take pieces of it, but it would seem to me that the first thing that we do in order to establish a reputation is to get something that we can do and succeed as soon as we can. And so and then we build on that. But you you have the dreams, and you could just, you probably all of you have written at one time or the other, how'd you like to see this village? Well, hell, I've spent my whole life with it. The torch is in your hands. Let me see what you would want to see out of this village, and let us help to see that we achieve that goal. And so I don't know how you guys want to do this, with all these minds here, I would not take the job of asking you to put it on paper and then to have someone to put it together. It would seem to me, right now, you might need somebody who knows how to do this. I mean, a professional that knows the business, that can advise you as to which levels of your goals you would want to achieve. One thing we can promise you is that we can bring the talent to you to ask the questions to see what we need collectively. And I'm not saying that we can bring a Samsung every week, but I can tell you one thing, if enough people know 
that you have the will and the goals that you want to achieve, they'll get to know you by reputation. But sooner or later, someone's going to say, well, what are you doing? What do you want to do? And that's what I don't know how I'm going to get that. Yeah, we've been, Bruce and I, and <clears throat> a few people in this room who were definitely putting out the call for a task force. We created a, um, a largely inspired by Inez Dickens, um, a white paper that we've been working on called Envisioning the Technological Future of Harlem. And that's been in progress for, for a few months now. So we are, we're working towards exactly what, what the congressman is asking for so that we can lay the groundwork for all of those things that are going to transform this community. So for those of you who would be interested in working with us um, through that, um, certainly see Bruce or I after this because uh, we are aggressively moving forward. Now, someone mentioned the word politician, which gives me an opportunity to remove my statesman hat, but... <laughs> You mentioned the name Inez Dickens. Now, Politics 101 is that, do you know who she is? Second, do you know what job she has? Second, do you know she's running for re-election? Third, do you know she has no problem, she's going to win by a landslide? <laughs> Third, do you know that she's the forerunner to be the speaker of the New York City Council. Uh, and lastly, <laughs> she cannot become speaker unless she has people like you energizing and telling the other city council members why it's so important to our community to have people from our community that would come to meetings like this so that no one will ever have to ask again how do you get to the politicians? Because they will be here because you put them in where they are. So just stand up, Inez Dickens. <laughs> and let me thank you for all the work that you've done uh, in order to make certain that you kept this spirit up, that you kept me really <coughs> involved. And we're going to grow in terms of, of support. All we ask you to do is to, to do the things you have been doing, and we will move this forward step by step. I get the impression in, in talking with David that he can't do anything and he, until he knows specifically what it is that we would want him to do. And the fact that he would take time out of his international responsibilities to be excited about us is a good, good beginning. So we can say that, you know, Samson is already interested in us and, uh, and get some other people to come down. But David, uh, you know, meeting you in Korea was such a, an inspiration and just listening to you, I agree that that was supposed to be a 20 minute meeting. And it, it turned out, just listening to the things that you have done uh, for so many other people, and in recognizing that diversity is where this country is going. The handful of people uh, that would want to stop it, yes, they, they said Asians couldn't come into the country. Now they got a whole lot of brown people who are trying to stop from getting in the country. But this one thing is certain, and that they're going to need the talents of everybody that's in this country in order for us to survive. And uh, the quicker they understand that the investment has to be made in us. The investment has to be in, not in our prisons, and not in the homeless, and not in the drug industry. It has to be right here. And I can't tell you how proud I am uh, that you've organized uh, yourself by city council person behind you, and David, uh, will you be my partner? Because anything they throw at me, I'll ask you to explain it to me before we get started. So this is just a beginning. Inez, I want you to say something before we okay, break it Thank up. you so much. But, but really, in, in answer to some of the questions, because Silicon Harlem has been working diligently on this, not just since I got involved, but before this. 
they got my attention. And I brought to them an idea. And Gary, this is to help with just, just what you're talking about. And now that we have Samsung here, I had brought the idea, and Gail, I want you to stand up. Come up, Gail, because she's been our tech queen in the city council. Is the idea of a tech hub, a technological hub here in Harlem. And I've spoken already to the Urban League and several others. So in answer to yours for international, that is what would bring us into the 21st century to get started. Um, Thomas, in reference to your question about NYCHA, um, I'm working with Silicon Harlem in order to bring Wi-Fi to the fire watchtower in Marcus Garvey Park, which would then be able to service our NYCHAs and enable us to not only educate them, but to provide employment opportunities in our community. Uh, in answer to Alizé, uh, in reference to funding, um, in the council, and I cannot speak for the state, nor the federal, you have to speak to Congressman Rangel, but in the New York City Council, um, there is a system of going on the line. Everything has to be submitted online. That's number one. Number two, you've got to have a Vindex number. Number three, you've got to have a prior contract. Number four, it cannot be for Harvard University. So I'm just I'm being honest so that I can answer some of the questions publicly so everyone will understand exactly how the process goes. The, the fourth and final thing is in reference to funding from the New York City Council. Every year prior to the opening of the budget season, before you go online to put in your application, I bring finance to Harlem twice, once in the day and once in the evening, in order to educate our community, our community, so we do not miss opportunities for funding. Most other communities don't have that opportunity, and that's so that we understand how you do it online so that we understand what you must answer so that it will not be an automatic rejection. I bring finance there, we bring computers to the state office building. Every year I do the same thing. I send it out to the community boards, I send it out to the churches, I put it in the <coughs> Amdam, Amsterdam News, so that the community, and I send out letters to those institutions that have been servicing this community in order for us not to lose any opportunity. I'm the first and only <coughs> black woman in leadership in the entire 250 year history of the New York City Council. And I don't want <laughs> our community to lose anything. And so I wanted you to really meet Gail Brewer because Gail is, 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 has service. She's been my partner in the council. She's been our tech queen in the council. Uh, she uh, was term limited out from the sixth uh, council district, but and she won overwhelmingly uh, with three other opponents to be our Manhattan borough president. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Bruce Lincoln, because he's been, we've had been part of our tech posse, uh, trying to figure out some of these issues. And even a decade ago, we went to all five boroughs, including Harlem, and had hearings. And uh, as you know, uh, in tech world, 10 years ago was like 100 years ago. Um, but one of the big issues that um, Gary mentioned is the issue to me of speed and cost. And unfortunately, the schools have the same problem. You can have fourth graders out in doing a video of the neighborhood, and you come back and you've got 30 young people and you put it on the, the laptops out of the cart and nobody can move because there's not enough bandwidth coming into that school. So, and then the cost is one because I know there's somebody here from Verizon and I'll get in trouble or the cable company. But we don't have much competition and so it's expensive. And so we can have all the broadband access and it can be available but you can't afford it. So that digital divide, I don't know how it works in terms of soul. I don't, 
do we need, if we have municipal Wi-Fi in Harlem, it's great, but then the nitro walls are pretty thick. And so you end up having to do some hard wiring. And then you got the last mile issue. So I don't know how it works in, in Korea, where we hear, we're very jealous. We hear all the time that we move into an apartment in Seoul, and we have a refrigerator, stove, and a connection. And we don't have that here. So we're dying for that. That's kind of like my mantra. Stove, refrigerator, and a connection. Um, but this problem of lack of municipal Wi-Fi, the parks don't really have it, etc. And I'm just wondering, is that municipal Wi-Fi? I still don't have the answer to everything, but that's something that we should be attaining. And I could talk a lot about this, but I really appreciate your being here. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, um, wrap it up um, very quickly here. If you don't know, David Ohm, actually, this is a very special trip for him to come here. He actually has to catch a plane tonight. So he is really sacrificed to be here with us. So we're very, very appreciative of that. Um, and I want to personally thank you, David, and look forward to receiving that watch. Um, <laughs> but um, we have a couple quick things. One is we, if you could just stay in your seats as we wrap up, we're going to let the Congressman say his final words and David say his final words. But we do have a provider that is providing Wi-Fi along 125th Street that's been funded by the Bloomberg administration that is here to show us um, how we can take advantage of that. Uh, he has a, a solution for, for businesses along 125th Street that have their own uh, internal Wi-Fi uh, systems. So that presentation is immediately following this. It's about a five to ten minute presentation, so please stay in your seats for that. Um, after that, we're going to hit hard on the bar and the kitchen. So I just got the note that says, let's going to hit hard on the bar and the kitchen. <laughs> and I see the other side. Oh, and here's the menu. Guacamole and chips, beef sliders and fries, jerk wings, vegetable spring rolls, grilled lamb, by Executive Chef Kenneth Collins. I don't know what he's <laughs> But please uh, patronize Mist. We want this place to be uh, very successful. So with that, uh, David on Congressman Rangel, you guys want to say your last few words? Well, like I said, this is uh, just the beginning. And uh, David, uh, you can include, uh, you can go around and tell the leaders of the world that uh, when Silicon Harlem kicked it off, you were there in the beginning with, when we done this. And I, once again, uh, I am so proud of the support you've given to me, and uh, so proud that Gail Brewer is going to be the president of the uh, Borough of Manhattan, and that you already have a, a leader in Inez. I don't think you can get a, a better start than that uh, politically. Now we got to get these things on paper and go to the private sector. Remember that our borough president this deals with El Barrio, Washington Night, Harlem, and Wall Street. You know, and Wall Street. <laughs> okay? So, uh, we we got the whole world uh, in our hands. We just have to figure out how we're going to handle it. David, uh, say, listen, thank you so much uh, for... Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I am actually, I have to leave because I have to go to the airport. I'm flying to Seoul tonight. Uh, so I would otherwise stay. I'm a little hungry. Uh, but thank you very much. It's, it's been an honor to be here. I appreciate your, your attention and your interest uh, on behalf of Samsung. Uh, we, we hope we can do more with Silicon Harlem and the community here. And um, as excited as I am for you all, uh, the reality is, is that when Congressman Rangel asks, you do. So uh, I, was, I was honored to be invited by him, and thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Give a big hand.